So this here is the seed library. This is where I store majority of the seeds that I've saved over the various seasons. Um, for me as a seed saver, the seed library is the most important thing for me because all this would go for naught if I didn't have a place to store it. And storing seeds for me is able to ensure the vitality of the seed as well as um, when to plant and where to plant. So you can set up your seed library however you want. Um, a lot of people will have it um, in their freezer or in the fridge if they have space. For me, um, I purchased a little bookshelf on Craigslist um, and then I was able to store all my seeds on the shelf. What's most important about the seed library storage is having it in a cool, dark place. So in this house, um, the seed library is on the north side of the house, which doesn't receive a lot of direct sun, stays cool throughout the entire season, um, and then also is a good place to know that the seeds won't germinate inside the jars or go rancid. Um, for me too, I, I really like to categorize and be specific about what seeds I have per season. So you don't have to be this detailed, but I did uh, spring, spring seeds, um, which also a lot of fall seeds fall um, underneath that same category. Flowers and herbs, summer, um, warm season plants, and then I have cover crop here at the bottom. Um, and that worked best for me because I know that when I go to pull a seed to either plant for this season or share with other farmers and growers, I know exactly where I'm pulling from. I also have a seed catalog digitally that matches everything that's on here. So what I like to do is have everything um, be in alignment with what's on my digital catalog. So I'll weigh my seeds, I'll alphabetize them, and then I'll also put them via season as well. Um, so I know, for example, these rainbow carrots which were harvested in 2022, are at two pounds right now. And it may not say it here on the bag, but if I look at my digital catalog, I know it's there. Um, the most important thing too, like I said before, is making sure that if you don't have access to climate control, like a fridge or a freezer for your seeds, the north side of the room is great, and also not exposing it to direct sunlight. So in this room, there are shades around the house, and then just for a little bit of extra protection for me, I just used an old bed sheet. And all I did was just uh, cover it up. And I actually double, double layered it to ensure that there's no light that comes through at all. So it works um, however you want to make it work, um, depending on your budget, depending on your resources. But it's totally doable, totally accessible. Um, and it's worked well for me and my farm for the past two seasons. So say that you haven't been able to find seeds from a seed provider online, or that you didn't really have success growing seeds this year, or you couldn't find a certain variety of seeds that you wanted to plant, well, here's a little tip that I kind of learned um, throughout the years where, say for example, um, I was growing butternut squash and I didn't have success growing it and I can't find any seeds online or in the store. Well, what I would do is actually would go to an organic grocery store and purchase a butternut squash. And then um, what I would do is of course eat the squash but then usually when you are cutting open that plant of course there will be seeds inside and also my dog is going to check out if it's something tasty or not so yeah there's little seeds inside and if it's organically purchased, grown, and bought, more than likely the seeds have not been sprayed with any sort of um, insecticide or pesticide or anything like that to kind of affect the maturity and germination of the seed. 
so, what I would do is instead of scooping these seeds out and throwing it in the compost or throwing it away or anything like that, I would actually scoop them out here. And then take them out. And then what I usually like to do is kind of lay them flat, make sure they're not touching each other or anything like that. And the reason why I won't, don't want them to touch each other is that there's moisture on these seeds and I'm actually gonna let them air dry. So I'll let them air dry, usually in between a paper towel, um, in a cool, dark place, so not in direct sun. I'll let them air dry in a paper towel in a cool, dark place. I usually will mark the paper towel when I've took the seeds out, and things like that. Um, and I'll wait anywhere between three days to a week to let it dry completely. And then after they're dry, you would have seeds that were from a plant that was grown organically that you can now transfer into your garden. Now, there's a lot of questions like, you know, like, hey, do I, how do I know if these seeds are viable? Well, try it out, you know, if you have access to a greenhouse or a hoop house or any way to really grow these seeds. Um, I usually like to test anywhere between 10 to 20. And if 10 out of 10 germinate, you know it's good seed. If five out of 10 germinate, you know, you might you know, you might have half viability. You know, if none of them germinate, then that means there's something wrong with the seed. And either try to find a norm, another organic source of that vegetable, or I don't know, maybe try to ask a friend or another farmer if they have that seed in stock. Um, but it's something that's worked very well for me over the last couple years. Uh, for example, I didn't have access to a popcorn seed and I was able just to go to the store buy like a uh, popcorn in bulk uh, and then plant it out and then get popcorn this year. We have um, Simpa Suchi or marigold seeds. Um, these are honestly like my favorite to grow. It's actually been um, a plant ally of mine this year um, just because I was really learning more about like the medicinal benefits of marigolds. Um, as well as just seeing how much bees, butterflies, even hummingbirds were attracted to this plant. Um, and the great thing about marigolds and a lot of flower seeds is they'll tell you when they're ready. Um, and the way that they'll do it is they'll just completely brown and dry on the, on the flower head. The petals will fall off, right, and then the seeds will start to really form on the inside. Um, you know, marigolds have all sorts of uses. They're used as, um, you know, uh, pest control, pest deterrent, um, when intercropped with other plants. Um, they're also very heating and warming. I've been um, making marigold tea during the winter months and I feel my insides literally warm up. Um, so they have a lot of good uses and benefits on the farm and off the farm too. Um, so I definitely want to plant these and grow these again next year. Um, so what I did was I just topped the head, so I cut off the flower heads when they're completely dry and the petals had fallen off. And the way to process these seeds is quite simple. You just take a container or your hand um, and you just give it a nice gentle squeeze here. And all these are seeds. And you can just see even from one flower head, you have this many seeds. And I didn't even squeeze all of them off yet. Um, so marigolds are great providers of seeds. And what I like to do is direct seed them um, once the soil has warmed up. So once you plant like your chiles or your tomatoes, like during uh, the summertime for your summer plants, um, you'll be planting marigolds or simpasuchi during that same time as well. A good rule of thumb is to uh, save four, four different seed heads, um, because even though they do give a lot, 
um, you want to definitely be aware of genetic diversity and making sure that you're um, increasing your genetic diversity of seeds as opposed to like just planting from one uh, one variety or one species. So what I'll do is I'll just squeeze this head and then I'll squeeze three other ones um, and then mix all the seeds together so that when I'm planting them, I'm planting a wide variety of genetic diversity um, to ensure good vitality and success uh, for future planting seasons.